Hi, my name is Jung Sung Park, and Javier and I will talk about deep learning for brain image segmentation. Deep learning is widely used in segmentation. For example, in computer vision, object detection is a good case. However, we can't just use the architecture that's used in computer vision to deep, lear uh, to deep learning for brain images, since brain images tend to be as huge memory 3D data and using the same architectures with the same uh, same 3D data would cause your memory systems to explode. So what we can do is first we could just use 2D slices, however that would cause a loss of information on a certain axis. What else we can do is use all the planes, all the three planes, and integrate their information together. So was, this would reduce the loss of information, however it could increase training time. Another thing we could do is slice the 3D data into 3D chunks. So this would be similar to the 2D slices, however it would be a stack of slices, so it would at least convey some information along the axis. Another thing we could do would be slicing them into smaller 3D cubes. This would widen the loss of information to all axes, but reduce loss of information from a single axis. Normalization problem follows this memory complexity since batch normalization is a very popular used normalization technique in deep learning. Since ReLU, the activation function that's usually used, has a mean shift problem, this batch normalization has been critical in architectures, and batch normalization, as the name suggests, heavily depends on the mini-batch size. However, due to the data size, we can't have a really large batch size. Um, these problems set aside, there are solutions as I introduced on the data size and also batch normalization like layer normalization or other normalization techniques. So I want to more talk about the goals of image segmentation in uh, brain imaging. One goal would be brain extraction, where we aim to extract the brain from a structure MRI. So it would be a binary segmentation where we segment one as a brain and the other as a non-brain. No methods would be free surfer, which uses intensity difference among gray matter, white matter, and uh, fluid. Beast would um, calculate the similarity between um, patches, patches of the priors and patches of the data. Bet would first binarize the image using a histogram-based method, and then update the surface uh, through iterations um, from the prediction. Registration is kind of similar to B's, but they transform the input to match the template. And then there's the deep learning based methods, where most of them use a unit type architecture. So what's a unit? Unit is, unit has two characteristics, uh, residual layers and multi-level features. So by residual layers, I mean that it has a skip connection from a certain layer to a further layer instead of going through all the middle layers. With this, and also they have a mass pulling layer where they downsize the image. So imagine we have a fixed window, and if we look at an image with this window, we will be looking at this portion of the image. However, if we downsize the image but keep the window size, it would it would as work as if we're looking at a larger portion of the image, even if we had the same window size. So using these, they use multi-level features for predictions. The variance of unit would be double unit, which uses two unit as one unit as a feature instruction and one unit as a prediction for uh, unsupervised segmentation. Then there's 3D unit, which is just a 3D form of unit for 3D data. And VNet, which replaces uh, the convolutional uh, the mass pooling layer with a convolutional layer to interpret more information and has 
more several changes like um, activation function. Another goal in image segmentation for brain imaging would be multi-label segmentations like tissue segmentation and surface segmentation. Now, tissue segmentation will be covered by Dr. Cheng later on, so uh, I want to talk about surface segmentation, and a good example would be Fast Surfer, which is a deep learning version of Free Surfer. What it does is takes the brain image, a uh, structure MRI, and then um, go through the model to get the multi-label of the surface of the brain. One thing to note is that it uses the whole structure MRI instead of br the brain as extracted image, and it makes sense since it would be just including another label to the multi-label segmentation problem. Another thing to note is that they are using a single decoder, a single prediction layer chunks, to predict multi-labels. However, this is not always the case, and, and there are some cases where they use feature extraction with multiple prediction layers, multiple decoders. So uh, the difference would be that they are, each decoder would do a binary segmentation instead of a multi-label segmentation. This would um, reduce the complexity of the model, however, increase the training time or the size of the model architecture. Next, Javier will talk about tumor segmentation in brain images. Thank you, Jiang Sang. Hello, everyone. My name is Javier Guaje, and I will cover the last part of this section, deep learning based on mutation. The problem that I'm going to talk about is tumor classification and tumor segmentation. So let's get started. First, we're going to see what are the biggest problems when we try to address this kind of tasks. The first problem is the contrast between the affected tissue and the brain tissue. This can be appreciated in, the, in this image and also affects several MRI modalities, so, such as T2 images, T1 images, uh, diffusion weighted images or T1 images with with some kind of contrast age and apply. But probably the hardest problem to solve comes with the nature of the affected tissue. Different types of tumor affect the tissue in a different way. This can be appreciated in this image here. So the first problem that we are going to discuss and abort it's how to identify the masses of the tumor in the brain tissue. One of the most common approaches to address this problem is by using probabilistic neural networks. These are easy and fast to train, but they require large uh, architectures to train. In this slide, we have an example of how one of these neural networks work. So we have an input layer. The input layer is then passed to the radial basis layer, which evaluates the vector distance between the input vector and the row weight vectors in a weight matrix. Then the distances are scaled by a radial basis function. And finally, this competitive layer finds the shortest distance among all the distance that we have, and then finds the training pattern that is closest, closer to the input pattern based on their distance. Once we have found the mass of the tumor, we can start to identify to identify the different parts of the tumor. For this, we need a specific data sets, and the most popular one is the BRADS data set, which includes a multimodal scans consisting on, of T1 images, post-contrast T1 weighted images, T2 images, and flare images. All of them are manually annotated by experts, and the annotation it's, it's divided in four categories or four layers. The edema, the non-enhancing core, the enhancing core in blue, and the necrotic or cystic core in green. In this slide, we can see the segmentation uh, overlapped on top of a flare image, 
for each one of the parts and uh, concaten uh, an overlap of all the images together. Additionally, this data set is also divided in two categories, the high-grade glioma or glioblastoma and the low-grade glioma. Here we can see one of the first approaches that tried to solve this problem. This was a paper proposed by Harvey in 2017. And it also includes the help from Joshua Benjo, who's one of the fathers of the deep learning. This paper proposed a cascade architecture, which can be appreciated here. And what this cascade architecture does is separates uh, the analysis in a global area and a local area, as we can see here in these two patches in this section of the image. The, con the combination of the analysis of the global part plus the analysis of the local part will produce a nice and very accurate segmentation of the tumor. Here we can see the results of different variations of this architecture. And here we can see the ground truth of the given in the data set. These were the three main architectures proposed by the previously described analysis. The first one was a cascade architecture using input concatenation, which can be seen here. Uh, the global analysis, the output of the global analysis is then concatenated to the beginning of the local analysis. The second architecture proposed was the cascade architecture using local pathway concatenation, which can be appreciated here. In, in this case, instead of applying, of, of concatenating the output of the global analysis to the input of the local analysis, the output of the local analysis is concatenated just to one of the convolutional layers in the local analysis. Finally, the last approach proposed was the cascade architecture using output concatenation, which it's uh, a concatenation just at the very end of the last layer of the local, uh, lay, local analysis. Another approach proposed by Wang in 2019 was a sequential analysis. This included two neural networks trained to segment big masses of the tissue of the tumor, and one neural network trained specifically to detect the cystic core or necrotic core of the tumor. These are some of the results for both glioblastomas and low-grade gliomas. This is a description of the architecture of the two neural of the three neural networks proposed in by Wang in 2019. Remember that the W net and the T net are used to select and segment big portions of the tissue. In this case, the tumor tissue and then the core of the tumor. And the E net was used to detect the cystic or, or necrotic tissue. The main difference between these two neural networks is the upsampling and downsampling applied to each one of the in-between layers. Finally, we're going to show a demo of one of these neural networks used to address the problem of tumor segmentation. In this case, we're going to showcase an out-of-focus layer for segmentic segmentation. This was a proposed um, solution by Queen in 2018. And what motivates this work was that classifying these kind of different objects in an image requires the combination of, the, of, of both local and global information. And by adding these parallel convolutional layers with different dilation rates, here in not, uh, notated as R1, R2, R3, and R4, 
we can analyze in a zoom in to zoom out the lower the r the smaller the patch and the greater the r the higher the patch and the more global features it's able to capture this layer and then summarize all that information before we pass that to the next layer which in this case was an attention mechanism that learns the specific weights or combinations of each one of these zoom layers to then segment the different part of the tumor. Finally, here we have a video in which we use Fury to show the result of one of these pre-trained neural networks using the previously described uh, idea. As we can see here, we have used the same color encoding that, it's, that was shown in the Brad's slide. And we can see how the tumor is segmented and overlap on a flare image. Last part in this video will be the necrotic or cystic core, as we can see here. And that would be all for this part of this section. Thank you so much for attending.